I wasn't given really a specific topic to talk about, uh, but because the concern um, today is the concern about the recession that Nigeria is in technically, and also because it's um, a meeting of planning and budget ministers. I thought I would do a proper economic presentation and put down my thoughts on where I think we are, why I think we are where we are, and what I think we need to do in order to get out of this. I'm sure there'll be many other presentations specifically on what a state can do or what you can do to raise revenues and so on, but having an overarching view of economic policy and where we may or may not have gone wrong and what the key drivers of growth should be for the Nigerian economy is something that I thought we should talk about at this session. So I've uh, written up this presentation, I call it Nigeria, the search for a new growth model. And I'll start by going back to the past, not just in Nigeria, but Africa. Let's ask ourselves what were the key drivers of growth in Africa and what has changed since this golden decade that Africa had. Can we have the presentation? Okay, so let's look at this Africa golden decade, which was basically the decade uh, of the 2000s. Africa moved from the previous decade where it was a hopeless continent a new decade where we had this story of Africa rising. And this rise in Africa, and this was across the board, was one tide lifting all countries, from a story of sadness and poverty and famine and hunger, to a story of, an Afri of a continent that was full of potential, where there were opportunities for investment, where um, capital markets were booming. All of a sudden people heard of countries like Nigeria, uh, Kenya, now Ethiopia, Ghana, uh, when previously these were all were all supposed to be a basket case um, in the world. Now the first pillar of this growth was clearly shifting terms of trade, um, which, which, as we all know, in development economics, can be a mirage. I mean, you can have you can have improving terms of trade. Um, when you're exporting commodities over short periods of the cycle. But we know as far back as the 1950s from the Latin American structural economists that over the long term, any economy that specializes in exporting primary products and importing manufacturers will end up having terms of trade shift against it. Okay, so you can have a temporary boost, but if you don't use that boost to then have the structural adjustment that will make you then For you to purchase and import one Sanyo flip phone, flip phone, telephone, you will need 19 barrels of oil. Okay? By 2008, one barrel of oil would buy you one of those phones. So that's, that gives you an idea of how well the terms of trade shifted. Uh, you had an oil price in the time of the days of Babangida of about $10 a barrel. At one point, under Obasanjo, and Joy, it rose to $140 a barrel. Okay, so, um, and of course, this was a time of rapidly improving technology, um, cheaper manufactured products, and therefore our oil could technically import us um, much more. Now, this process was not common across all Africa because there were other African economies that grew. So there was certainly not just one pillar, okay, and I'll go to the second pillar of growth. And the second pillar of growth in Africa in that decade was debt. Now, if you look at the next slide, please. Now, if you look at this slide, between 2002 and 2008, the stars up there show what the levels of debt to GDP were in African countries and the bars were what they became after the Paris Club debt relief, after the HIPC debt relief and so on. You can see Nigeria, we were at 50% debt to GDP and we came down to literally about 5% or so. Okay, and this happened across all Africa. Debt forgiveness, debt relief, debt restructuring, and so on. Now what this did was it freed up government balance sheets. And then in that decade of Africa rising, the countries just went back on a borrowing binge. 
Nigeria just kept borrowing. We're not borrowing externally. I think our external debt today is about $8 billion on the balance sheet. But if you look at the Naira indebtedness of the Nigerian government, we're spending over 30%, I don't know, it could be 40% now, of every Naira we earn just servicing debt. Okay, and that's what you have with the quiet delivery. Nobody was noticing. We'd written off the debt and then we kept building it up, bit by bit. And when you now look at where that debt was going into, you'll see why or part of the answer to the problem that we have today. So you have these two pillars. You had rising commodity prices, and we monetized all revenues, we were able to spend money, and then those that didn't have oil were able to borrow because the balance sheets could accommodate more debt. So you have this relevering, and you can see that. Now, where did all this debt go? Did it go to roads? Did it go to power? Did it go to refineries? Did it go to infrastructure? No. The new borrowings were simply recycled into much higher recurrent expenditure. Okay, so what that did was that it helped sustain a consumption boom. And GDP was growing largely driven by consumer spending. Okay, uh, look at public sector wage bills in real terms. Nigeria, Ghana, Ethiopia, and Kenya rising significantly from 2005-2014. Okay, now um, in Nigeria, for example, our public sector wage bill went up from 443 billion in 2005 to 1.7 trillion in 2012. Okay, in 2010, the government increased minimum wage, 18,000. I was in the central bank. I protested and protested. They had an election coming. They increased the minimum wage to 18,000 naira basically borrowed money to pay. In 2012, as governor of Central Bank, I said this was an unsustainable wage bill. We needed to reduce the size of the public service. My own government minister came out and said that was the governor's personal opinion. In fact, the government wants to employ more people. And this is the result. No, I'm serious. Because the problem is, and sometimes I don't Look, I'm never going to change. I'm never going to be political. I'm never going to stand and tell people what they want to hear. Okay? The, the problem is there is nothing, there is nothing that we are facing today that we did not know would happen. That is the truth. We made mistakes, many of them deliberate. We ignored every single warning. This has happened. Economics is a science. It's not, it's not a perfect science, but over decades and decades and centuries, people have seen that there are certain things that when you do lead to certain consequences. And as you, if you, if you take a brand new car and give a driver who doesn't have a license to drive it, and you have an accident, you really can't say you were surprised unless you're some kind of idiot. Okay, so um, we knew that this was going to happen. You can't just keep borrowing money and paying salaries, not building roads, not improving power. And we'll come and see uh, the numbers, the per capita investment in development in Nigeria, the per capita revenues we're getting. And this was all from a resource that was in an enclave economy. And just so that we're not always blaming the previous administration, we have also made mistakes in this administration. We have started retracing our steps, but we have to retrace those steps. And if we fall into the same hole that we fell into the last time, where the government is always right, you know, when the minister is there, you tell them, oh, you know, honorable minister, we, um, we, Nigeria is very lucky to have you in office. No, you tell the minister, you're doing well, sir, but you know, there are these areas where you must change. If a policy is wrong, it is wrong. It is wrong. Nothing will make it right. And it has to be changed. Okay? So, this is what we did. Look at real sector wages. And this was not just Nigeria. It was all over Africa. Um, next. All right. So, look at sovereign debt fueling growth. You know, take, take the example of an individual, okay? You, you happen to know a number of bank MDs and you can make a few phone calls and get loans. So, you borrow one billion here today, 
and built a very nice mansion in Abuja. Borrow another billion and you and your family go out on first class and you're traveling all over the world. Borrow another five, six billion and buy a private jet. You know, you, you've got many people in Nigeria who are very rich, who we think are very rich, but who are really bankrupt. But everything, everything is being financed by bank debt. Okay? When, you, when, 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 when one debt matures, they have enough connections to call another bank, borrow and refinance that debt. They're not earning anything. They have private jets, they have yachts, their families travel first class, they go abroad and stay in the most expensive hotels. It happens. It is happening today. Now, wh what do you think of those people? When you think of them, you think they're foolish people? Do you think they're wise people? No, well, what do you think of, do you, would you say they're foolish people? So what would you say of a country that does this? <laughs> you know, so, so you, you fuel growth, you borrow money, pay salaries, people spend money, fuel consumption spending and fueling growth. It's fine, it's short term but it is not sustainable. How much can you continue borrowing and consuming without producing? And every time, and you know, the funny thing is, you did not have to stop borrowing. All you had to do was borrow the right amounts and apply them to the right purposes. And it doesn't matter whether it's consumption spending or investment demand, GDP would grow. So we made a choice. We made a choice of we wanted votes, we wanted popularity, or we wanted a palliative. So long as people are getting a high minimum wage, they would keep quiet about all the other things that were happening in the economy that we should be talking about. Next slide. So you can see the relationship between public debt per capita and GDP growth. Now, we, we are in a new reality, what you'd call the new normal in Africa. And we have a two-speed Africa. If you look at the IMF World Economic Outlook, you'll see something interesting. Non-commodity Africa will be the fastest growing part of the world. Even higher than emerging Asia. Whereas commodity Africa, countries like Nigeria and Angola are among the lowest growing parts of the world. We're growing at the rate of Europe and Latin America, and emerging Europe, and MENA. And we'll try to explain why. But think of a country like Ethiopia, okay? Under Meles Zenawi, late Prime Minister. Ethiopia kept growing year after year at 11%, 12%. And what did Meles do? the simple things we have been saying for decades and decades and decades and decades. This is a country that came out of a war, remember? It's facing insecurity, it's got Eritrea around it, it's got other countries that do like it around it. I'll give you two examples. Coffee. Coffee originated from Ethiopia in the world. I mean, the world coffee comes from Ethiopia, okay, from Amharic. But Ethiopian farmers before Meles would get 10% of the value of coffee from their crops. Okay, so they would just produce the coffee and sell, and these companies would take their coffee to Latin America or somewhere, have it improved and dried and then packaged and so on. And so now we just asked, why can't we produce coffee in Ethiopia that will go straight from Ethiopia to the Starbucks shop? And they had all sorts of things. Well, you know, um, your weather is good for growing coffee. Your coffee is very good, but your farmers have bad farm practices. You know, I said, okay, fine. So why don't you teach them? So you got the IFC. They brought in loans. Starbucks came in. They put together your Ethiopian coffee farmers into cooperatives. They taught them how to grow the coffee, how to dry it, how to air it, how to protect it, how to package it. And today, you go to a Starbucks shop 
and you will take a cup of coffee that came straight from a Ethiopian farm. And Ethiopian farmers are now getting 70% of the value of the coffee from, one, from 10%. Okay, so he says to Aliko Dangote, you know, come and build a cement plant here. You know what? I'm going to give you electricity at three cents per kilowatt hour. For a cement manufacturer, that is all the incentive you need. So Dangote goes, builds the most sophisticated uh, cement plant in Ethiopia pays, gets electricity almost for nothing, but the cost of cement drops by 60%. The construction industry gets boosted, roads are being built with cement, jobs are created, and a new industry has taken off. He says to the Chinese, I don't like this idea of you're coming to buy hides and skin and leather from Ethiopia and then sell us shoes. Do you know Nigeria imports 3 million pairs of shoes per annum from China? I don't even know how much duty they pay. I'm not talking about expensive shoes. I'm not talking about what you sell to, what you import from Pierre Cardin or Gucci. I'm to be talking about shoes that people wear on the street, things that can be brought here in the tanneries in Kano. You can produce all the shoes you want for primary school children, for secondary school children, for school bags. Millions and millions of pairs. But no, you know what we do? We export the wet blue. And we import shoes from China. And we have Chinese people coming here to take wet blue. And take to China and bring back shoes. You know, we, we're just a very interesting country. It, look, everything, every single thing we are talking about today, about what we need to do, was, if you go back to documents, I have a document, Industrialization Potentials of Northern Nigeria, under Ahmed Bello, 1962. There is nothing we are saying today that was not part of the industrial plan of northern Nigeria in 1962. You know, we're clapping ourselves that after 50 years we have learned nothing. The whole industrialization of Kano, starting from Bompai to Sharada to Chalawa, was based on that plan. Just based on very simple logic, very simple economic logic, you cannot continue. I mean, in the 1950s and 60s, they understood what was the essence of colonialism. It was come to these countries, take their raw materials, uh, you, um, process them, and sell the manufactured goods and keep shifting the terms of trade against them so you get rich at their expense. And they understood that independence was not about a flag, it was about reversing that process. They understood it, we didn't. They understood it. And therefore they said, you know, we need to stop exporting our cotton, we need to build textiles industries. We need to stop exporting groundnuts. You know, Kano used to take pride in groundnut pyramids. I still have people who come to me as Amy. I say, you know, Amy, you know, you must bring back those groundnut pyramids. I don't want groundnut pyramids. I want oil mills. What am I going to do with groundnut pyramids? Okay. They, we, they stopped exporting groundnut pyramids and built all these oil mills. We should stop exporting hides and skin. You know, you had huge multinational corporations who came to Nigeria whose business was to buy hides and skin. A company like John Holt. In fact, in Hausa, anyone who, who trades in skins is called Ben Janho. Ben Janho. Janho is John Holt. It became a Hausa word because this was a multinational whose duty was to just to buy hides and skin and take to Europe to produce shoes which we would buy. 
So they said, let us build our own tanneries and produce our own shoes and our own bags. It's so bad in this country. Tomato paste that our wives use in kitchens is imported from China. At best, it is packaged in Nigeria. Now we have um, a, a paste factory um, 40 kilometers from Kano, but that's about the first. Tomato. We cannot process tomato. We have to import tomato from China. We're a very sad case. A country of 167 million people, last week Nigerians were celebrating. We went to Rio and came back with one bronze medal. I saw Nigerians jumping. One bronze medal. Tied for last position. Somebody said, at least we are on the medal table. You know, you, you, we don't have ambitions as a nation. And no country, and this is why some of these things are not just about numbers. It's about a mindset, it's about the people, it's about an attitude. Do we really love our country? Are we really, do, we, do we feel any shame when we see that Malaysia that came and took palm uh, seeds from us is now exporting palm oil to palm oil? Palm oil. Eastern Nigeria, that's all they eat. We can't produce it. Vegetable oil, groundnut oil. I went to my friend's house in Lagos the other day, they gave me tea, what do you call it, Moringa, in a nice package tin, Moringa, that we grow all over, that grows wildly here. Somebody takes it, puts it in a tin, packages it, I didn't even know it was called Moringa until I took the tea. Gives it an English name, now we know what it's called in English. It was only when I drank it, they said, we have nice words, when I drank it, I said, ah, but this is, um, Zogale. If we had packaged it and called it Zogale, it would have been known as Zogale tea all over the world. Just like people know coffee from Ethiopia. But now it's called Moringa. A house man doesn't know what Moringa is and it's growing in his backyard. He'll go and take pounds sterling to import Moringa tea. Now, this is what we did. So, non-commodity Africa. So this is what they did, this is what Ethiopia did. This is what um, countries like Kenya, and I'll show you what countries like Kenya did, which we didn't do. And therefore, Nigeria is right there in the lower band, and non-commodity Africa is in the upper band. Next slide, please. Now, what is it that works? What is it that these non-commodity African countries have done that we have not done? First, take a model that is investment driven rather than commodity and consumer driven. Look at, the, look, at the, look at this chart. At the very top, who do you have? Ethiopia. You have Uganda. You have Rwanda. You have Ghana. You have Kenya. Then you have Egypt. And who at the bottom? Angola and Nigeria. And if you talk to Deo in Africa, they think Nigeria and Angola are the richest countries because they are the oil producing countries. We are the worst performers in terms of investment to GDP. Look at those countries, look at what they've done. Okay? Now, if you do that, you deliver high growth that is also inclusive. If you continue working on a consumption model and a rent-seeking model, your growth is not inclusive, which is why in Nigeria you've had over the past two decades um, increasing income distribution inequalities. Because it's very easy to be very rich based on rent. And again, gentlemen, we can always talk about the policies of previous administrations. We can talk about all subsidy and I turned all millionaires. You know, we have also created our own billionaires since 2015.
from foreign exchange subsidies. Yeah, I know people are shaking their heads. They don't understand what they are. So let me give an example. You know, before, I didn't just become an AIM, before then I was governor of the central bank, before then I was a bank MD. So I have friends in the banking industry. If I sit in my garden, you know, when the central bank was selling dollars at 197, and people were buying at 300, if I sat in my garden and picked up the phone, I would have enough people to call in the industry to get you $10 million at official rate. Do you doubt it? As a former MD, as a former governor, and as what they now call a royal father. <laughs> and, no, 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 I want, you, I want you to think about it. I sit in my garden and make a few phone calls. I get $10 million at 197. Sell at 300. I make a profit of what? One point something billion. If I do that four times in a year, for doing nothing, for doing nothing, I would have had four billion naira. And people were telling us that this policy was to help the poor. We are not devaluing because if we do, the poor people will suffer. You know, the people that were profiting from this were people telling the government that if you devalue, people will suffer. Meanwhile, they all got the dollars at 197 and priced their goods at 300. The poor paid the price of a devalued currency, the rich skimmed off the profit. And it went on for one year. We talked and talked and talked. If this government continues to behave the way the last government behaved, we will end up where Jonathan ended. You may not like it, but that is the truth. You have to listen. You don't need to be an economist to know that any system that allows you to sit in your garden with a telephone call, make one billion naira without investing a couple. That system is wrong. It is unsustainable. No matter how you think about it positively. So the first thing I would like to say is that there are many voodoo economists parading around. And many of them are not economists. They're demagogues. They tell poor people, anyone that says devalue wants you to pay a higher price. It is arithmetic, it's not economics. You don't need, and I keep saying it, many of the arguments I've seen in newspapers, you know, sometimes I feel like writing back then, I remember I'm an Amir. <laughs> and I'm not supposed to you know, even this one that I'm giving, maybe somebody will say, Amy, please stop giving these kinds of lectures. But you have someone who writes what he calls a brilliant economic paper. And he's telling you that if you divide the currency, prices will go up. Is that economics? It's arithmetic. It is arithmetic. You ask your primary school boy in primary three, if the dollar costs 150 naira today and tomorrow it costs 300 naira, what will happen to prices? He will tell you prices will double. You can calculate. 1 times 300 is 2 times 1 times 150. That is not economics, it's arithmetic. The economics of it is these billions that have been skimmed off by people who, who get official exchange rate. Should you put them in the state? Should you give the states their revenue, for example? Should you take dollars 
For every one billion dollars taken from the Federation account and sold by the CDN at 200, the states were losing 100 billion naira that could go into salaries, into agriculture, into healthcare, and the states were going to borrow from the same government on a bailout when the government was selling their dollars cheaply to a small group of people. What kind of economy are we running? Who is advising the government? I have asked that question. I want to know who is advising so I can talk to the advisor. Okay, so, you know, we, we didn't have money. All price had collapsed. Avengers were blowing up all wells. The scarce dollars we had we were selling cheaply, subsidizing people. And what was the argument? You need to promote manufacturing. Thank you. What percentage of your GDP is manufacturing? 8%. 8%. And let me ask you, Commissioner. You're a manufacturer. You are able to secure... 10 million dollars from the central bank to import raw materials and produce goods. You get 10 million dollars, you spend 2 billion naira, get 10 million dollars, and somebody says to you, listen, I'll, I'll pay you 3 billion naira for this 10 million dollars. So you make a profit of 50% for doing nothing, just buy the dollars and sell. Your option is to buy raw materials, establish a letter of credit, import raw materials, maintain generators, have diesel, pay labor, produce a good, take the risk you may not sell at a profit, transport it, or to make a profit of maybe 10%, make a margin of 10% over a 120-day period. What is your choice? What would, you, what would be your choice? You would, you would import a manufacturer? You have an automatic guaranteed 50% return immediately for no labor. So every manufacturer abandoned production and started looking for forex. I know. Because I had people who would telephone me and come to me all the way, make an appointment and say, Your Highness, please, I want you to help me get dollars. They wanted to turn me into a dollar middleman. So every manufacturer decides that I will get the dollars and I would sell. Instead of buying raw materials, instead of producing. So what happens to employment? What happens to production? And what do you end up with? A recession. And why are we surprised that we have a recession? We created it. We created the recession. But you know, we didn't call it, we called it what? We called it demand management. People were using words they did not understand. You want to manage demand? Fine, you manage demand for industrial raw materials, you are also managing industrial output. You manage demand for inputs into services, you manage down service output. The result we have was the result that we were always going to get with the set of policies that we put in place. And if we don't realize that we made this mistake, and I'm, I'm glad we seem to have, but we need to just come out and come clean. That is the best way, you know. We have taken a few wrong steps. It was all done in good faith. We genuinely wanted to help the poor people. We realized we made a mistake. Now we are retracing our steps. Then we begin to talk. So, next slide. This is your GDP versus federal government, government spending. And this is Nigeria. From 
a base in 2005 to 2015. You can see how nominal GDP has been rising, and you can see it's been driven largely by recurrent expenditure. Okay, and if you look very closely, what you'd find is that recurrent expenditure seems to spike when it's the eve of elections. Your economy has quadrupled in nominal terms since 2005. Our population has grown by 40 million since 2005, but capital expenditure has not changed. You have 40 million more people but you don't have more power, you don't have more roads, you don't have more schools, you don't have more hospitals, you don't have more houses. So where are these 40 million people going to be? The Niger Delta Creeks and Sambisa Forest. Where, where are they going to be? That is where they are. Our economy, at least in part, created terrorism by simply not creating the opportunities for these young people. And if you think the Niger Deltas are something, or Boko Haram or something, or other insurgents are something, let me give you another number. We have over 160 million Nigerians today. The median age is 19. In the next 20 years, you are going to have at least 80 million Nigerian men and women between the age of 20 and 40. Now, maybe the next generation you can do something about it. You can start family planning, and co but these ones have been born. They have been born. And we have to prepare for them. Those of us who are alive now, we have to prepare for what we are going to do with these 80 million young people. We can't kill them. And if we do not expand the earnings base and the production base of the economy through wise investment and very difficult but appropriate decisions, we'll end up in a classical Malthusian situation where the resources cannot support the population and you start having wars and pestilence. And this is Reverend Thomas Malthus, one of the very first lessons you learn in EC 101. All right, next slide. Look at the road ahead. You know, again, we, 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 this is all a culmination of a whole set of policies that are wrong. And also, and let me, let me say something, there are times in the history of this country where we had it right. And then we didn't continue. A lot of the reforms done in the second term of Obasanjo laid the foundation for if we had just continued to build on them, laid the foundation for sustainable growth. But then we kept um, going back and forth. So look at these numbers. And again, I'm, I'm hoping that in here we're not like the ordinary in, in nerd Nigerian, that we do feel a sense of shame at what we see. You have, you've got your per capita nominal income, Angola, Botswana, Cote d'Ivoire, Egypt, if you are going all the way to Zambia. Per capita income in Kenya is 1,388. In Nigeria, it's 2,743. So on paper, Kenya is half as poor as Nigeria, or half as rich as Nigeria. Now, how much is Kenya able to raise as tax revenue per capita? $232. How much was Nigeria raising in 2014, 2015? Um, 117. Now, how much was Kenya spending as development spent per citizen? $129. How much was Nigeria spending? 17 You know, 
the results you see are not just results. You know, they, they, they don't just come out of nowhere. They are the direct consequence of deliberate policy decisions. If you choose to make it very profitable for people to produce fake bills of lading and claim fuel subsidy and build um, estates and private jets, you are never going to have refineries. If you make it profitable for a Chinese man to come to Kano, now in Kano, the Chinese are doing tie and die. Even the dye pits that have been in Kano for 600 years are at risk. We've been talking about protection of these industries. Minister of Planning, nobody has done anything. You know, in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, if people of Kano start pitching Chinese and throwing them into the dye pits, because they are importing dye. Simple dye, they've come, they took the technology from Kano, went to China, now they come and ask people for the pattern that they want. They come in, they bribe the customs because there is no way you can produce that thing in China, bring it, pay duty, they bribe customs, they come in, they sell, and our industries are destroyed. The textiles in Kano are gone, the tanneries and leather industries are gone, a combination of a lack of electricity, a lack of infrastructure, a lack of investment, and very bad trade policies. And we have to go back to the drawing board. This is why this conference and the Ministry of Planning are the most important economic ministry. I've always said that the planning minister is the most important economic minister. Assuming that one, assuming one, that he, he is able to produce a very good plan, and two, that the government listens to him. And this is why I thought, instead of coming here to talk about just monetary policy and fiscal policy, I will talk about them. Let's try to get into a mindset where at the federal, state, and local levels we can actually look, you know, and see what we can do to change um, this thing. So, are we going to inv are we going to adopt an investment-driven model? Now, we talked about the public sector and public sector funding. And when I come forward, I will show you that for planning ministers, you need to think beyond what the government budget is. Your job is not about if, if you want to build a road, your job is not about whether you can raise enough taxes to build the road. It is whether you can fund that road. So the combination of taxes and debt and investment and PPP and whatever, that road needs to be built. That refinery needs to be built. That power plant needs to be built. built. It doesn't have to come from the government's balance sheet. Nobody says the government must fund every single thing that is development. And this is where investment becomes important. We are, don't, we are not getting money from oil. Our non-oil revenue is not rising fast enough. Anyway, it cannot, there's a limit how much you can tax poor people. We all talk about taxation, but there's a limit to how much you can tax a man who is not able to eat. Okay, so you have to think, how do you get money? And then there's a limit to how much you can continue borrowing in Naira. Because you've reached your, you know, we, we play with these numbers. When I was in Central Mark, people said, oh, you know, our debt, um, debt to GDP ratio was 25%. Therefore, you know, it's nothing to worry about. In South Africa, it's 70%. Your debt to GDP ratio is 20%, but you're spending 30% of your revenue servicing debt. What does that tell you? 70% of your GDP does not generate government revenue. Agric is about 35%. How much debt does it, how much tax does it pay? Wholesale and retail trade, how much tax does it pay? You have a GDP where the tax is coming from the formal sector and coming from the all sector and telecoms. That's your government revenue base. And those sectors constitute maybe 30% of GDP. 
So for all intents and purposes, gentlemen, if your debt to GDP ratio is 30%, and only 30% of your GDP is generated revenue, you are at 100%. Until you broaden your tax base. Because if you just look at debt to GDP ratio, there's no reason why the Nigerian government cannot borrow another two, three trillion. But let them borrow now. Where are they going to pay? You don't pay. You know, people, people keep using these numbers. You don't pay debt from GDP. You service debt from revenue. Nobody talks about debt to revenue. They don't talk about debt in academic journals, yes. But we go and say, you know, our debt to GDP ratio is only 20%, so it's fantastic. Next slide, please. Okay, what's the good news? Is that Nigeria is not all about oil. I know we all think it is oil, but it's not. Oil does not form even a critical part of our GDP or our growth. Look at these numbers. That's your GDP per capita. The present value, okay, the present value of your oil reserves is in that black, the dark part in 2016. Okay, which we calculated, which was calculated based on 37.2 million barrels, $60 a barrel, production horizon of 40 years and discount rate of 12%. If you sold the entire oil reserves of Nigeria today, the proceeds would add only $1,164 per head compared to GDP per capita of 3000 in 2016. Okay, so people should not, first of all, those making noise about oil should stop making noise about it. And those who are afraid should stop being afraid. Oil is not critical. Oil is just working capital. That's all. We sell it, we get the dollars that we use to import. If you can find another source of working capital, you can do without it. It is 15% of GDP. When I was governor of Central Bank and the economy was growing at 37%, the oil sector was not adding anything to GDP growth. It was in decline. The growth was coming from agriculture, coming from services, coming from trade, which is also very revealing. Because if we are now saying that we are in a recession because of the collapse in oil price, we are not being sincere. You can't be in a recession because a sector that is 15% of your GDP is in decline. What happened to agriculture? What happened to health? What happened to services? What happened to trade? Okay. Next. Something else to look at. And this is the slide that got me sacked from my job. You know, the truth will always be there. And I like these, I like PowerPoint presentations because figures tell you more than a thousand words. These are our external accounts. Now, look at Nigeria and look at Kenya. We've had up there in the blue line, these are current account surpluses we've had from 2005 to 2014. Okay? Not even when oil price crashed in 2014 did we have a current account deficit. I think today we're heading into a deficit, but um, up to 2014, we had current account surpluses. Now, below there, you have other investment assets, which would be your capital inflows, okay, and your reserves, and you have something called net errors and omissions. Look at 2013. The errors and omissions were about $20 billion. Can you see that? From about minus 5 to about minus 35. Correct? 
about, uh, no, about 30 billion actually dollars. Now, when you're an accountant and you produce accounts and errors and omissions are 70% of the numbers or 60%, what does that tell you? These are, these are national accounts published by the Central Bank of Nigeria. And the Central Bank is telling Nigerians, look, and because they're on that side, look, all we know is that we, this is money that we think should be in the economy, but we cannot find it. And people didn't want me to talk. Now we are hearing where the money went. All sorts of revelations that nobody thought were possible. Every day. That is it. They were captured in errors and omissions. Now look at Kenya. They do have errors and omissions, but compare the errors and omissions bar to what they were able to account for. Yeah, 5%, even 10% is acceptable. But when you cannot explain where 50% of your earnings went, and the country continues, and nobody is asking those questions, and even when you tell Nigerians that this is the thing, they say, don't mind the man. Look at that. So, where do we have a problem? First of all, as you can see, we, we're, we have not been able to attract investments. All the other investment assets have been headed out. The errors and omissions are out. It means the money went out and did not come back. Anything below the zero line represents money that went out of Nigeria and did not come back. Anything above represents what came in on a net basis. Now, a country like Kenya was having huge trade deficits, and that's why the blue lines are below zero, but was able to attract investment, and that's all above the line. And that's why Kenya is growing. We earn the money, we don't attract any kind of investment, apart from portfolio flows. How much investment, how much new investment do we have in the oil sector? How much do we have in refineries? How much do we have in roads? How much do we have in agriculture? When you talk to people, they will tell you these sectors are not profitable. But why are people investing in Kenyan agriculture? Why are they investing in roads in South Africa? Why are they building bridges? Why are they invest, investing in power plants in Ethiopia? I'm chairman of a company called Black Rhino. By the way, I don't have a cowboy in that company, but I'm a chairman. Okay? Steve Schwartzman, who owns Blackstone, says to us, gentlemen, here is $5 billion to invest in power projects in Africa. The joint venture with Dangote on the condition that for every one dollar you put in, Dangote puts in one billion. So we have ten billion dollars to invest. We have projects in Ethiopia, we have in Eritrea. We have in Kenya. I accepted, I accepted to be chairman on one condition and on one condition only. That he will allow me to fix the power problem in Kano. And he said, if you can find a good power project in Kano, I'm okay. So, now, power companies are here trying to invest, negotiating, and then what do we hear? One day, some judge in a court sits down and says, reverse the tariffs. Now, I'm here talking to somebody in New York who cannot understand that and a power plant can come that a government can issue a power uh, privatization plan 
that investors can come in, that there is a regulator for power, that they look at the numbers, look at the cost of power, look at what is cost recovery, agree on a tariff, announce that tariff, they bring in their money to invest on the basis of that, and a court in the same country says this is illegal. You know, for, uh, for, for you, for us, for, for you sitting here, and for Nigerians, this may, not, this may not sound like, in fact, people were saying, yeah, they're cheating us. What it does, what that one judgment does in terms of the signals it sends to foreign investors is disastrous. Any country, there is no country in the world where a court has agreed to interfere with commercial transactions between the government and private investors that are aimed to attract investment. There's a contract. The judge did not even say, do not give this going forward. He said the ones that have been done are illegal. And you expect somebody now to come and bring in $2 billion or $3 billion to invest in power in Nigeria? knowing that you can tell him this is a tariff and tomorrow your court can wake up and say that tariff is illegal? You know, so, if as a plan, as planning ministers and commissioners, if you decide up front that investment is important to you, the entire system has to be such as to make sure that these signals are not set. Your customs officers should know that, okay, this is the this is duty, pay correct duty. Don't ask for anything on top. It discourages investment. If a man is entitled to five-year visa for bringing some kind of investment, he gets it. He doesn't need to know anybody in immigration. The courts should respect legal agreements. And the right incentives to provide, and when you provide the incentives, do not review. Every government comes in, and the next thing you know is some businessmen come to them and say, you know, the last government gave this one tax incentive. The last government, and you start reviewing and reviewing and reviewing. The next time you offer somebody your own incentive to invest, he will not come. Because he believes that the next government will reverse it. If the government has made a mistake, it's made a mistake, it's gone. You don't, you then offer your own set of incentives or make sure that they are transparent. If you offer somebody an incentive in cement, make sure that every cement manufacturer gets that same incentive. Fine, it's sectoral. Assuming cement is important to you. If you offer an incentive for agri, everybody who meets those conditions should get that incentive, not just somebody who knows his way around Abuja. The farms are not in Abuja anyway. Okay, so look how you can see this. Basically, no investment has come in. And this is, this is one, as you can see, I'm building a consistent story that you've had a growth model driven by commodities and consumption, which is your problem, and you now need to shift and have a growth model that is driven by investment. And for this forum, it means you've got to stop thinking so much about how much the government can spend as in how much can we get into this economy. Lagos has done it very well. If I have money to invest, I will invest it in Lagos. Because Lagos is attracting investment. Lagos realized a long time ago that the government cannot fund all it needs. And I just love what Lagos has done. Lagos, the Lagos story is a story of what Nigeria can do with itself. transparency, consistency, regulations. Yeah, people can be rich. There's no problem. If, if people are, are rich while growing an economy, nobody minds. But in Nigeria, people become rich when people are dying. Let's take the Lagos story. 
And that's why Lagos today is what? 30% of Nigeria's non oil GDP? And Lagos can do without oil? Lagos can do without the rest of this country. So we must not let Lagos go. I'm telling you, this country is better off with Lagos than with the Niger Delta. Let's not make that mistake. We should be together as a country. Every part of the country is important, but let us not be so obsessed by a resource because we're obsessed by it because we've had a commodity-driven model and we are blind to the potentials of an alternative model. Lagos doesn't need oil. If you, do, if you don't, if you, if you produce it and earning, you can buy all the oil you need. And what is oil anyway? A raw material. You don't drink it. It's a raw material. You need, need it to move your vehicles. Now you have electricity. You need it to fuel your generators. Now you have solar. You have biomass. The future of oil is not there. So those people who are trying to break up this country over oil, after some time, that oil will be worthless. You are better off being in a country that is based on this model. This is the country of the future. That is the past. Next. Exchange rates. Let me start by congratulating the government for making changes. Unfortunately, those changes were a bit late and the adjustment has been very severe. Now, my sense is that where we are today, the Naira is already undervalued. Okay, if you look at the real effective exchange rate, we are below the zero line. Now, I don't know how many economists are, but basically what this means is you would have to, if the Naira were to strengthen by about 9%, you would get exchange rate parity. Okay, so you're not really under any more pressures for a devaluation. Okay, this is, this is a nominal exchange rate adjusted, adju adjusted for relative prices and also adjusted for um, weights of our trading partners. So on a trade inflation basis, the Naira has gone from one of the most overvalued currencies when we're at 197, okay, to one that is undervalued. So that adjustment has been made by the central bank. What the central bank needs to do is basically just allow the system to operate properly and stop panicking. You know, because from what you can see here, even if it, the market starts at 320 or 340 or 350, if you allow it to operate, it will revalue itself and adjust. What is causing the problem is all the sense that, well, we are not entirely flexible. And sometimes wrong signals. After you have allowed a flexible market, you act as if you really don't believe in it. And then people, you know, because, you know, these things don't just work on fundamentals. I was in the central bank. The, the markets work on the basis of confidence and perception. There was a time speculators started hitting markets when I was governor of central bank. The Kenyan shilling got hit, divided by 25%. Ghana, you know, um, got hit, fell by 30%. South Africa got hit, and they started heading towards Nigeria. And I called an emergency monetary policy committee meeting, jacked up um, M MPR by 200 basis points, jacked up CRR by 400 basis points, and declared that I would defend the currency. I didn't have the money to defend the currency, but everybody believed me and they left me alone. <laughs> the markets work based on confidence. By the time you've taken over one bank, fired one bank empty, they believe you, when you make a threat, they believe you will do it. So I made many threats as governor of Central Bank that I never carried out. You know, if banks messed up, I said I would remove them. And because I have removed bank MDs, I had no intention of removing the guy. Because I had removed bank MDs, they, sorry sir, 
They fell in line. So if you are going on a flexible exchange rate, have the nerve. You have produced a fantastic document, stick to it. You can't be any worse off than you were. You're already in a recession anyway. So you're trying something different. So try it and try it properly. Next. Real interest rates. Again, central bank has raised them. People have been attacking the central bank for raising the rates. Why? Yes, they, they say in, it's not just about inflation. It's about stabilizing the currency because the truth is that where we are today, the only way you are going to reverse this recession is to increase liquidity in the foreign exchange markets and reduce the gap between the official rate and private market rate. And this is what I think the central bank needs to keep doing. A flexible exchange rate regime and positive real interest rates would combine to bridge that gap, bring in the dollars that we need to finance imports, and those imports of raw materials are the things that will increase production, and that in production is what will lead to growth. So, I have been very, very critical of what the central bank has been doing since the beginning of this administration. I am very, very supportive of the research it has taken in the last few MPC meetings. All that we ask is they have produced a fantastic document on, on first exchange rates. They should do it. Okay? And on the TSAs, they should just realize the difference between a dollar balance sheet and a naira balance sheet because i have seen now this whole thing about banks being banned from foreign exchange market for dollar tsa the naira balance sheet of banks is highly diversified government deposits were maybe 20 percent of deposits you see banks are financial intermediaries they engage in what's called maturity transformation they borrow money short term and lend long term on their NARA balance sheet, they have this money coming in every day, current accounts, savings account deposits. If you tell them to pay off government deposits, they pay off, they go and send marketers out and raise money. On their dollar balance sheet, Nigeria only earns dollars from all sales. The IOCs have their money in international banks. NMPC is the only provider of dollar money, and they have lent out that money. If you apply the same rules, on the naira balance sheet, dollar balance sheet, without looking at concentration risk, you bring the banks down. They have lent out these dollars. Look at the, the maturity of their assets. Give them time to pay back the dollars. For them to pay back those dollars, they have to find dollars elsewhere. Where are they going to find? Who is the other exporter? Apart from oil, what do we export in Nigeria? Where? And that is the point. So, um, they need, to, they need to be very careful how, and I know this is gotten, because so long as you know where the money is, let give them the time to sort out their assets and pay back. Don't precipitate a banking crisis. And this idea of banning banks from foreign exchange markets, banks in the history of this country, and Dr. Shamsi Zuzman knows that, very few banks have ever survived after being banned from foreign exchange markets. Because it has a number of costs. It's not just about profit. Banks have lent money to customers who depend on imports to produce. If banks can't buy dollars for those customers, they can't produce, they can't pay back their debts. You build up non-performing loans. So let us think through the consequences of some of these decisions that we take. But apart from that, I'm extremely supportive. I think the central bank is doing the right thing. And I think we should encourage them to continue along that path. And I think the government should be given credit for being able to say, we are going to retrace our steps. Now next, again, the government has moved on this, which is eliminate wasteful subsidies. I don't want to go into, I, I think I've said enough about fuel subsidy. I've been saying this since 2011, 2012. Um, we've seen everything. Just an interesting thing. If you look at... 2011-2012, in theory, because I don't believe it, we were importing about 60 million barrels every day, 60 million liters of PMS every day, 60 million liters. 
now we are down to a little over 30 million liters. Has our population gone down? Do we have fewer cars? Are we consuming less? All those numbers were fake. People, again, you can go back to the record 2011, 2012, I sat in front of the House of Representatives and made a presentation. I produced documents. I had documents that showed people claiming they had 15 vessels of 30,000 metric tons of loading in Lagos on the same day. And they were being paid subsidy based on those documents. People sat in their offices, produced bills of lading, bribed everybody from customs to PPRH, whatever, and got money out. All they needed was a paper that said you had a location. And based on that allocation, they would go. So I'm glad again we're moving towards removing these subsidies. They're painful. Uh, let, 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 let me try, let, let me um, make that clear. If you have to pay more for fuel, it hurts, it bites. But the truth is that no system is perfect. And the subsidy system benefits a very small group of criminals, much more than it benefits the poor people. And if you're going to subsidize, please provide this subsidy in production. Okay? Provide cheap gas to power plants and set power prices at a level where they can make a profit, okay, without passing on high gas prices to customers. Reduce the cost of setting up a business. Reduce the tax burden on pioneer industries. Okay? Subsidize production. Do not subsidize consumption. Rather than give poor people subsidy on fuel that never gets to them, take that money and put it in their hands. Who is spending $6 billion, $7 billion per annum on fake subsidies. And where is that money today? It's all in private jets, private yachts, expensive jewelry, property abroad. That's where it is. It's not in this economy. It's gone out. One number I'll give you, 2011. Nigeria earned $16 billion from the oil sector in 2011. I was governor of Central Bank. $16 billion. We established LCs worth $8 billion for importing petroleum products and spent another $8 billion on petroleum subsidy. Every dollar we earned from the oil sector went back to petroleum products in 2011. Not one dollar from the oil sector went into education into healthcare, into roads, into power. It went into importing fuel and paying subsidy on imported fuel. The numbers are there and the records are there. And in fact, if you look at that um, town hall meeting that has been going on on channels, I gave this number then. Not that this one I'm saying will change anything no I'm just saying it because uh, uh, tomorrow uh, <laughs> but if you invite me you will hear okay uh, 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 look at power generation that's what we need to focus on let's get the power reforms back, back on track fantastic policy power was privatized what happened people bought discos because they had connections they made, look, um, Dr. Usman was, was head of what was called the Technical Committee on Privatization and Commercialization in the 1980s. I know because I was a merchant banker and I privatized Okomo. Okomo Oil Mill is still there, a solid company. You know why? Because when they were in TCTC, they had a process where you don't just buy a company. If you say you are going to invest, they had, they had a process of making sure that after you bought that company, you made those investments. 
They didn't just sell assets to you. Privatization is not just about selling an asset to people. It's about making sure that not only do they pay the price for the assets, but they go ahead and make the investments they committed to making when they bought them. So you've got discos who bought our discos, who said they would invest and they have not invested. There's no metering. Okay? So we need to continue with the power reforms. Um, next slide, please. We need to look at land registries. And Lagos, this is where you need to, you have done well, but you need to do better. In Lagos alone, you have 13 procedures to register land, according to World Bank doing business report. It takes 77 days. 10% of your property value and the quality of land I mean is 7 out of 30 compared to 22 in the OECD countries. Now, Lagos has now moved. They are merging all relevant laws into a single piece of legislation. The only reason I'm not praising Lagos is I want to see the result first. But they have at least realized that this is a problem. And I hope all states will look at this. Uh, this is something else. So power, land reform, very important. And having that database is critical, especially for agriculture. Map your land, give a, give a, give, give a, C, give a CFO, let the farmer be able to use that land as collateral to borrow or security. Um, many of you have read Hernando de Soto's The Mystery of Capital. Um, land is capital. I mean, I have that big problem here in Kano. Especially in the Muslim areas, in the, in the Muslim villages. A woman's husband dies, he leaves her a farm. She doesn't farm. So her husband takes over the farm. He farms it. That is her capital. And she gets no return on it. He uses her farm, he earns the living, and then he gives her um, chop money from her own money. Okay? I'm chairman of a group called Babongona. We're working on farmers trying to improve their yield. And I'm having that problem. And I get to the district and say, you know what? Get all women, all Muslim women that own farms. Sit with their husbands. This money that is being given for seeds, for fertilizer, for inputs, is being given to the woman who owns the land. If her husband wants to be the laborer, let him be the laborer. If he doesn't, let her get somebody else. No, seriously. She owns the land. So we tell these women, this is your asset. You are the one. You are the owner. You are the boss. This is your land. We will give you this loan. If your husband is ready to farm it for you for a fee, let me it. Otherwise, we will find a farmer for you. Give the farmer the seeds. Pay him his wages. And take the profit and give the woman and help her set up a small-scale industry in her home. And... If you don't do that, so this issue of land is crucial to addressing poverty, especially poverty among rural women. Many of them own land that has been hijacked by their husbands. And they remain poor. Okay? And it's all cultural. Because what I find, for example, in Chujungwada is that the Christian women, okay, have learned to farm. And they come out and farm. And they're wealthy. The Muslim women have been stopped from farming, but... In the name of culture, what the men have done is that they have taken away their capital. And it's not religion. And therefore, we have to, as leaders, address these social issues as part of economic rejuvenation. <laughs> right, next slide. Trade policy. You know, I keep sounding like a broken record. 2012 or 2013, I wrote an article in the Financial Times of London in which I criticized China's relationship with Africa. It was very controversial. I don't know if you, if you read it. If you just Google, you'll see it. Now look at this. This is our trade with China. 
we are all importing from China. Those that export to China are exporting oil or solid minerals. China's interest in Africa is not our development. America's interest in Africa is not our development. Europe's interest in Africa is not our development. China's interest is China's development. America's interest is America's development. Europe's interest is European development. Please, our government, our interest should be Nigeria's development. If the Chinese are going to come back and set up textile factories in Nigeria and buy cotton from our farmers and employ Nigerian workers and produce this, these textiles and sell to us, they are welcome. If they are going to produce textiles in Shanghai, subsidize them, bring them here, bribe our customs officers, I'm sorry, you know, um, come to our market and destroy our industries, we have to say no, sir. If China is lending us money and we are going to pay back that money to import equipment from China, we should please check that those equipment are properly and transparently priced that we cannot get them cheaper from another part of the world and that they are of a high quality. This idea that I'm lending you $1 billion to buy rice mills from me, which you can get at half the price elsewhere, you have already paid interest of 100% if you don't know in the price. It's not a cheap loan. Now, we go to these countries, we think we are, we are, they, these are no strings attached. And especially at this time, that the World Bank and the IMF and the Europeans are saying we want you to pursue policies. China does not interfere. We are running to China. It's a good partner. I'm not, we must trade with China, trade with India, trade with Europe, trade with America. I have nothing against any of them. What I want us to do is to sit on the table with them and negotiate trade agreements that protect our interests because that is what they are doing. And that is what every reasonable country in the world does. So I think we've talked about fiscal policy, we've talked about monetary policy, we've talked about trade and industrial policy, and if there's any message I have tried to send is that we had a model historically that was driven by commodity growth, by consumer um, spending. We have a future that is based on investment that should come in, we need to move to an investment-driven model. We need to have some element of state planning. We cannot just allow the market. If you, the, the market will not put money in agriculture. The market will not put money in refineries. Or you have to provide the incentives and lead capital into those areas, and that's where you're important. And that is, for me, the way forward. Yes? Okay. So what's the summary? So the years of Africa rising were one where one tide could lift all boats are behind us. Sustainable, inclusive growth now depends on investment. Please, every planning commission, remember that it's investment. Okay? The role government can play is defined by getting appropriate macro votes. And we've said that you don't have enough money. You've seen how much money you're raising per head. It's not much. The government, even, you know, we keep talking about moving from recurrent to capital expenditure. Even if you move money from recurrent expenditure to capital expenditure, if the pool does not increase, it's not much. So the government doesn't have the pocket to do it. You've got to look for private investment, local and foreign, to do that. And you do that by having appropriate macro policies, and the government is getting it right finally, and also creating a supportive business environment. Okay? So set FX rates to incentivize inflows, set interest rates. Uh, that has been done. You can see those tick, it has been done. Eliminate subsidies, that has been done. 
Now, address failures in the power sector value chain, starting with the discourse, digitize state land registries, streamlining relevant, relevant legislation, reprioritize public spending towards investment in human capital, and protect infant industries. Anybody who tells you not to protect your industries is deceiving you. That's why they're called infant industries. You have to protect them. If you go for a football tournament and take the Nigerian under-16 football team to play against Wayne Rooney and the English team, the result is clear. That is why when you have under-16, they play against under-16. Is that not true? If you ever have under-16 playing against 18 to 20, you will say, okay, 11 against 5. Isn't that what you do? That, that is what is called a level playing field. But if they go and put under 16 against big men, and you say playing field is level, it is not level. Your industries cannot compete when they are infants against the Chinese. They can't compete against the Indians. I'm not saying go and protect everything. I'm not saying go out with outright bans, but there must be a way of ensuring through um, power, through infrastructure, through industrial clusters, through research and technology, through technical and vocational education, and through appropriate trade and tariff policies that critical industries are incubated until they can compete before they're allowed to go out on the street. Next. Thank you.